Good morning, Crossroads family. Thank you so much for joining in today and all who are sharing in our online service. Thank you for being a part of this today. And as always, I trust that you'll be blessed as we worship together, as we pray together, and as we hear God's word together. Our announcements remain about the same. Services are suspended until further notice, and it does look like we'll be suspended through Good Friday and Easter though there are some hints of some relaxing of the uh, rules on gatherings. Uh, it looks like they probably will come so late it will be difficult to respond and prepare uh, for uh, in-person services. So we'll continue. Good Friday, a service will be prepared and we'll uh, get together on Good Friday and then also on Easter morning as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Easter Sunday will be a Communion Sunday, and I would encourage you to be ready for that, uh, both in heart and mind, and, and then also with the physical um, items there. If you would like the small Communion cups that we've been using lately in the church that come complete with the wafer and the juice, please be in touch. You can leave a message on the church phone or call Lou or email and uh, Lou and Dean would be happy to drop some of those off at home. And those of you with keys can pick those up in the office. There's a basket of them set up in, um, in Ziploc bags, and you can take what you feel that you'll need in the next little while. If you have too many, we'll bring them back. When we get together, we can use them at that time. The annual general meeting is coming up in April, April 25th, and the reports are being prepared. And we thank the Lord how he kept us through this past year, even though we are under suspension and only were together about 20 or 22 weeks out of the, out of the year. But we thank the Lord and always we thank you for your faithfulness in giving your tithes and offerings to sustain the ministry of Crossroads. I bring you greetings from Paula with ICCM, and there is an attachment, those of you who have received the bulletin, an attachment there from ICCM, and ministry is continuing well. Uh, Paula and David are doing well, and the ministry is continuing on, and of course she's looking forward to when she'll be able to visit some of the projects that are being supported. And she's thankful to Crossroads for all of the support over the years towards ICCM. Food with Friends got a shout out in the Observer this week or a week ago or so. And we are thankful for Chrissy and all who are serving there. Um, Askew's uh, gave a donation uh, towards the food for the meals with the Food with Friends. And we're thankful for that and thankful again for all who provide and all who are preparing and all who are serving Food with Friends and making those vital connections to encourage the hearts of many on the streets there. Well, would you join me together in the call to worship? We gather to share in our love of God. Lord, open our hearts and let us share your good news. We gather to share our witness to God's goodness. Lord, let us bear witness through service to your people. We gather to praise God whose love is eternal. Lord, open our hearts today to sing your praises. We gather to hear your word. Lord, open our eyes, ears, and hearts to see you, hear you, and know you thoroughly through your word and by your spirit. Transform us so that others will see you in us and believe. Amen. Let's join together in worship. We begin with a hymn, One Day. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born, to live among us, and to die for us. And then we'll continue on with blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Let's join together.
As we prepare our hearts for prayer, I'd encourage you to listen and read the, the words of this next song. You can hum along and sing along as you're able and comfortable. But the song, its message, my troubled soul, why so weighed down? You were not made to bear this heavy load. Cast all your burden upon the Lord. Jesus cares. He cares for you. Your worrying won't help you make it through. Cast your burdens on the Lord and praise that mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord, the lifter of my head. Praise the rock of my salvation. All my days are in his faithful hands. It's difficult not to worry. And it is so much easier to say don't worry to someone when we don't have the worries and the concerns that they have. But again, we ask ourselves, my anxious heart, why so upset? When trials come, how you so easily forget to cast your burdens upon the Lord. And today we have so many burdens that we want to bring to the Lord for ourselves, for others, for today and for the future. And we're not fatalistic, but we put our trust, trust in our Father, trust in his faithfulness trusting ourselves to his care and to his strong hands, his faithful hands.
Amen. He cares for you. Jesus cares for you. And he knows your struggle. He knows your trials. Lean into him today. Let's pray. Father, today we pray for all people in their daily life and work. We pray for our families and friends, our neighbors, for those who are alone. We pray for our community our country and the world. Lord, we pray for justice and freedom and peace, and especially peace in the hearts of the peoples of the world. Lord, we pray for those who are in danger today, for those who are in sorrow, those who are in any kind of trouble. And Lord, we cry out to you for those who are sick. Lord, there are those ones today that are suffering with cancer, heart issues, Lord, others who are looking on and giving care. And we pray, O God, for your presence, your grace, O Lord, and today we cast all our cares on you. And Lord, we've called out to you over days, over weeks, over months, and over years for some of these same issues. And Lord, today just help us to cast that care on you as we call out the names of each one of these ones. O God, come and do your work. Today, Lord, we pray for Bob and Vi, and we pray that you would just continue to sustain them and bring healing and strength, O God, and grace in the midst of trials. Bless them, O God. Bless their home and make them a blessing to many. And Lord, we continue to pray and we pray for peace and unity within your church and for all who proclaim the gospel and all who are seeking truth, O oh God, work in their hearts. We think of First United right here in our community and for their minister, Jenny, and Lord, we pray your blessing upon her as she leads and as she serves, O oh God, and as she's preparing for sabbatical, O oh God, bless her, Lord. During this time, let it be a time of refreshing that she'll come back renewed and strengthened to serve you and to serve your people. And we think of the leadership in place as she takes this break, O oh God, and we pray that you would just use each of them again to continue to sustain and serve and encourage and strengthen your people. We pray for our Bishop Cliff and the national leadership team and all of our pastors and ministers, leaders, and congregations across the country. Again, be their portion, be close, and bless and minister, we pray. We thank you, Lord, for the many blessings of this life. And we just exalt you, O King of heaven, and we praise your name forevermore. In this Lent season, O God, we pray to you for forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us. In your compassion, forgive us. 
the sins that are known and the sins that are unknown, the things done and the things left undone. Lord, uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to honor and glorify your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Gracious God, you have heard the prayers of your faithful people, and you know the needs even before we ask. And you know our ignorance in asking. Grant our requests as may be best for us. This we ask in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. And thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and so free. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world, now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself.
Today we're looking into John, John chapter 12 and verses 20 through 33. And we begin with these Greeks who had come up to the Passover feast and they were in search of Jesus. Verse 20, now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we would see Jesus. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. It would seem that they came to see Jesus, but not just to see him, not to just physically see him passing by or see him in the crowd. They wanted to see him and talk with him and wanted to understand a little bit more about him. They were likely Gentile proselytes who had come to, to worship at this feast. They'd come for Passover. They would have been stuck in the, in the court of the Gentiles at the temple because they were foreigners, they were Greeks, they were Gentiles, and they couldn't enter in. But Jesus himself said, I have come to be a light to the Gentiles. Also, of course, the glory of God's people, Israel. Jesus, when he spoke to the centurion, said, Many will come from the east and the west, and they will take their place with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as much as Philip might have been surprised that day, it was no surprise to Jesus to see Greeks that were seeking after him. Christ was pleased to welcome them. The Greeks may have been there and seen Jesus as he cleared the temple of the, the money changers and those that were selling the animals for sacrifice. He may have seen him in his indignation, taking a whip and driving these people out because they were turning the temple into a place of business, a place of commerce, instead of the house of prayer that it was intended to be. And it could be because of these Greeks and others who had come, but yet couldn't hear because of the commotion of the animal, the animals, the, the sellers, and the money changers. But these Greeks came and saw Philip, and somehow they recognized him and knew that he was a disciple. And they said, we want to see Jesus. We want to understand more. And it would appear that they came with a, a hunger, a searching, hearts that were seeking after God, that were turned to the spiritual things. They came looking for Jesus. They wanted to be introduced. They wanted to understand him. They, they wanted to understand his mission. Not just to hear the stories and not just to, to be near and near the excitement, but they wanted to understand who really he was. They'd seen enough and heard enough that they wanted to know more. And they came and they said to Philip, we wish to see Jesus. We would see Jesus. And I'm sure it was not an idle curiosity. Today in our selfie culture, we're eager to get a picture with the, with the famous, with the well-known. But this was not idle curiosity. They wanted to know Jesus. Many years ago, I was sitting in a hotel and the manager was a friend of mine. And I had noticed as we had entered, I'd seen the convoy, all of the vehicles now empty but convoys of military vehicles and limousine. And I knew someone very important was in the hotel. As we walked in, I could see soldiers and police and guards and, and all of these ones that were keeping this important person safe. The flags on the car revealed it had to be a, a government official. So when we were seated and the manager came to say hello, I asked him, I said, if you're able to share, would you tell us who's here? He hesitated for a moment and then he said, the vice president is here. And immediately I said, I'd like to meet him. He laughed and I laughed. And he walked away, talked with a couple of the guards that were there. And those guards went and talked to someone else. And someone came and asked us, why do you want to meet him? And I said, well, we pray for him regularly. He leads and serves the nation. And it would be such an honor to say thank you to him and just to greet him. They smiled and walked away and said, we'll see what we can do. And after a few minutes, one of the entourage came and said, the vice president is ready to meet you. And we went out and the, 
soldiers and guards were now in the cars and around the cars, and they gave us a place to stand and, and wait. And a few minutes later, the vice president appeared. He was a delightful man, warm and caring, and he came and shook the hands of each one of us, got our names and work that we were doing, and thanked us also for serving in the country. It was a great honor and it was a great privilege. Our meeting was short, but it was meaningful. We had known him through the news and now we'd had a chance to say hello and to say thank you and to hear his thank you to each of us who served in the nation. It was a privilege and it was an honor, but I met him one more time at a pastor's conference. As we were preparing for the conference and I was part of the committee, the question was asked about a guest of honor and it was decided that the vice president would be invited. And the committee looked at me and said, well, David, you know him, so you'll be the one to introduce him at the conference. And of course, I laughed. I don't know him. And of course, I didn't know him. I had met him, yes. And I'd followed him in the news like everyone else. But they said, you're the only one who's met him so you'll introduce him at the conference. And it was such a great privilege as more than a thousand pastors were there that day to stand and introduce the vice president. And he came with his words of encouragement to the conference. We were thankful for his encouragement at that conference. And I was thankful for the day that I was in that hotel and saw his entourage and said, I would like to meet him. But these Greeks, they came in search of Jesus, and their encounter with Jesus would be life-changing, life-altering when they came to meet the Lord. Well, Philip was a little bit concerned. Verse 21, it says that Philip went and told Andrew, and he was wondering, what do we do about it? And just like those that were surrounding the vice president, they looked at me, and they looked at those I was with, and they looked at each other, and they had to discuss, how do we do this? How do we arrange this? Should we arrange this? Is it appropriate? So Philip went and he told Andrew. And then Andrew and Philip together went and told Jesus. What were they nervous about? We don't know exactly. But they were wondering, what do we do with this request? Should we fulfill this request? Should we lead these, these Greeks to come and, and meet Jesus? And so Philip is asking Andrew, back me up here as I go to Jesus. We don't know what Jesus is going to say. They didn't just point Jesus out in a crowd. And they recognized that these probably were Christ followers, though, that they, though they were Greeks and were from another place. But they went and they told Jesus. And everything we know from Scripture is Jesus never turned anyone away. He never hid from those that sought him. He was accessible accessible to the needy, to the suffering, to the searching, to the sorrowful, to the sinner, to the penitent. He was always ready to befriend and bless and save. The Old Testament, Isaiah 45 and verse 22, look to me and be saved. And Jesus came to fulfill that, look to me and be saved. And so these Greeks came and said, we would see Jesus. We want to meet Jesus. And it looks like Jesus met with them. And Jesus had said, come to me and rest. Come to me, whoever has a burden, and I will give you rest. And they wanted to know him more. And know him they did by the end of this conversation. And isn't this a question that we are asked regularly? We want to meet Jesus. Maybe not in those very words, but our neighbors and our friends and our family, our co-workers, those that are parts of clubs and societies and on the golf course, they want to see Jesus. They want to know the meaning of life. They're looking for answers and they come in search of Jesus. We want to see Jesus. And it's for you and me, just like Philip and Andrew, to introduce men and women and young people and children to Jesus. And maybe our answer is a little bit like John's when John saw Jesus coming and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Whatever the language, we need to introduce Jesus. 
we would see Jesus. We want to meet Jesus. And sometimes people don't even express the name of Jesus because they don't know what it is that they're searching for, but they're searching. So they came and they found Jesus. In verse 23, and Jesus answered them. Them. Who exactly is that referring to? Andrew and Philip only? Andrew and Philip and the Greeks? And we don't know how many Greeks there were. Later we read that the crowd heard the voice of God from heaven. So who exactly was in the crowd? So we are assuming here that it was Andrew and Philip, the Greeks, and others who were around the temple that day. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour has come to be glorified. The hour. He's telling them that my mission is about to be fulfilled. You will witness my death, my resurrection, and my ascension. And all of the scriptures will be fulfilled in this, my mission. My hour has come. The hour has come. And it's not good enough for me to be a teacher and a miracle worker. It's not good enough for me to be the king of the Jews. But the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He was facing this Passion Week, the suffering we see the fear and the confusion and the disillusionment. But then we also see Christ in his glory. We do see his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his crown. Seated on the right hand of the Father. And we see the salvation of multitudes. The Son of Man must be glorified. And he continues on, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, and if it dies, it bears much fruit. Christ was about to be placed into the tomb to bear fruit for all of eternity. He would die and rise and bear much fruit, multitudes that would come to the name of Jesus. So he teaches them here that true gain comes through loss. Enrichment comes through giving and giving of one's life. Victory comes through suffering. Think about the acorn, the acorn becoming the oak tree. Much can come from a seed. The seed dies as it goes into the ground, but it bears much fruit. It produces. Isaiah 61 and verse 3, it says, I give you beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that you might be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. The oaks of righteousness. From that acorn, from that planting, from the death of a seed, the oak grows. And the Lord promises you will be those oaks, the planting, the righteousness of God, the planting of the Lord. Our life in Christ, the blood of the martyrs, bears much fruit for God. We give our lives away. We continue on in verse 25. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. He talks about being that follower in fellowship and in service to God. Personal service to the Lord Jesus Christ. Personal servant of Christ. That should be our highest ambition, our highest goal, to be a servant, a minister, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our love for him produces obedience, a life of service. You're not your own, but you're bought, bought with a price. And this is what Jesus is getting across to all of his disciples there, the Greeks and everyone else in earshot. And he promises a place in the kingdom, place in the kingdom where you are useful, 
a place in the kingdom where you enjoy that fellowship with others and fellowship with me. And he promises eternal life. And then he says, you will also have the honor of my father. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. Do you want the honor of almighty God? Follow and serve. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. He continues on, and now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. He asks the rhetorical question, should I ask to be saved from this? And as a human, he has this anticipation. He knows the burden of the cross, the opposition, the persecution. He's facing pain and humiliation, sorrow and death. And also, he knows that all those that are close to him, family and his disciples, are also facing that sorrow as they look on his death. It is the hour of suffering, the hour of battle with the enemy, the prince of darkness. And the human side of him says, what shall I say? What shall I say? Lord, take me out of this. Save me. Let this cup pass from me. But then he declares, but for this purpose, for this purpose, I have come to this hour. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works of the evil one. He gave his life a ransom for many. So he's very decisive. As he prays, as, as he cries out, he didn't pray, save me. But instead, as he continued, he says, Father, glorify your name glorify your name. He was there, submissive, obedient to the Father, and he wanted to bring glory to his heavenly Father. And a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the crowd that stood there heard it and said that it thundered, and others, an angel has spoken. And obviously, because we have it here recorded, there were others who heard the voice of God. Some mistook the, the voice of God for, for thunder and the voice of an angel. They knew something exciting was happening, but they failed to hear and understand the voice of God. And here was the Lord Jesus Christ. And apart from his own thoughts and his own feelings, his desire was to glorify his Father, to be obedient. And the voice of God was a reminder, a confirmation of the promise the promise of Christ's obedience, his obedience to death that would change human history for all of eternity. That is, in his death, he would conquer sin and even the grave because he would rise again, bringing new life to mankind. He would rise to the Father in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God on high, crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. And on the day of Pentecost that he would send the, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to empower his people, his church on the earth. It was a confirmation of the promise of God's work in believers. It was a promise that the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the good news, would bring glory to God and mankind to fellowship with him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. He knew the Father. He and the Father were one. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. To some, it was the voice of God. Those with discernment, with spiritual ears to, to hear and understand. So for his disciples, for John who recorded these words, for others that were there that, that heard and understood. But to some it was thunder. It was just noise. It was exciting. But it was just noise. It was thunder. And others who maybe had some spiritual understanding, they said, this is something heavenly. Must be the voice of angels. But even there, they seemed to think that the angels were muttering or mumbling because they didn't understand what was being said. If they'd heard what was said, they wouldn't say this is the voice of an angel, but this is the voice of God.
To them it was indistinguishable, the voice of an angel. So Jesus is confirming that his Father has spoken. And these words for those that were in the hearing, it was for your sake and not mine. So that you would understand who I am. And he continued on, now is the judgment of this world. The ruler of this world will be cast down. There is going to be a battle and it's not going to be about swords and armies and chariots. But this is a spiritual battle. And the ruler of this world, the prince of darkness, the devil himself, is going to be cast down, cast out. He's going to be gone. The ruler of darkness will no longer have sway over the hearts of men. The ruler of darkness is about to be defeated. And he continues, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And he said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. If I be lifted up, if I be lifted up on the cross, I will draw all of mankind to myself. All people of all ages, I will draw them to myself. They'll need to look to the cross. He was foretelling the death that he was going to die. And still for his disciples, it would have been so difficult to see all that was going to transpire in that week. To see him nailed to the cross. But he was telling them, this is how it has to be. That people of all ages, of all races, of all faiths and all backgrounds will need to look to the cross. Not to gold or silver or political systems. Not to kingdoms. But they'll need to look to the cross. And it's not a polished cross. It's not a cross made of gold or silver or precious metal. Not a cross with diamond studs, but a dirty, rough, blood-stained cross. If I be lifted up to the cross, I will draw all men, all people, to myself. Mankind will be transformed by it. They'll be lifted up by it. They'll be brought to the glory of God. So Christ transformed that blood-stained cross transformed it, lifted it up. He brought glory to God on that cross. And he brought redemption to mankind. The cross of shame became the cross of glory. Father, glorify your name. And the Father was glorified because he gave his much-loved Son to die on that tree and he loved the world so much that he accepted his sacrifice. He accepted Christ's blood and Christ's death for the remission of your sin and mine and the sins of the world, all who would call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Greeks came and said, we would see Jesus. And Jesus said, you will see me and you'll see me lifted up. You'll see me lifted up to the cross, and I, when I'm lifted up, when I'm lifted up on that cross, you will truly see my divine love, the divine love of God the Father, and I will draw all people to myself. In the cross, we see divine love, the love of the Father and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we cannot see a Christ apart from the cross. That's the gospel, that's the good news, because he took our place on that cross. He lived an exemplary life. He taught, he had compassion, he healed the sick. But as the Greeks and Andrew and Philip heard that day, the hour has come. There was need for the cure of sin. And Jesus cured sin on the cross. The hour has come, and I will lead the way, and I will pay the price, and I will give my life. Follow me and serve me. So as much as we see the agony and the horror of all that's about to transpire, we see the love and the compassion and Christ's desire for you and for me and for mankind to be in fellowship with him. And he calls to us, as he did so many times, as he did on the seashore. Follow me. 
follow me and serve me. And the great promise, and the Father will honor you. The Father will honor you as you serve me, as you follow me. What is it we want today? So many times we're looking for honor. The world is calling out, we would see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. We want to understand him. And we want that transformation that only he can bring. And they look to you and they want you to introduce him. Would you introduce me to your friend? We want to see Jesus. And the world looks on and the world wants to see Jesus in the church. They don't want to see us fighting and gossiping and complaining. The world looks on and wants to see Jesus. Just as those Greeks, we want to see Jesus. We want to meet him. We want to understand him. We want to understand his mission. And we want to be a part of it. But we need to see Jesus. There was something in Philip that they recognized. And when they saw Philip, they said, we want to meet Jesus. Would you introduce Jesus to us? People are looking on you. And whether they ask it with wondering eyes or whether they ask it with words, like these Greeks, we want to meet Jesus. But can they recognize in you something that's different, something that's attractive, that they'll have the boldness, they'll have the courage, and they'll even have the interest to come and say to you, we would say Jesus. We would see Jesus. We want to meet Jesus. What a beautiful compliment to Philip. We want to meet Jesus, and you're the one to introduce us. And when they met Jesus, Jesus said, you need to look to me. You need to look to me high and lifted up. Lifted up on the cross. And then you'll know me. And then you'll understand me. And then you'll have that spiritual life that only I can give. If we want to see Jesus, we need to see him high and lifted up. Lifted up on that cross. Drawing all mankind to himself. And we need to follow him. And we need to serve him. With all of our strength, with all of our being. We need to put our full trust in him. And in this life, we look for honor. We look for honor from the media. We look for honor from our clubs. We look for honor in the awards that we hope to receive. Accolades. Accomplishments. But Jesus said, if you want honor, if you want real honor and you want honor from my Father, serve me. Follow me. Serve me, and my Father will honor you.
And now the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you serve him this week. Keep him high and lifted up, because this week someone might come and say, we want to see Jesus.